the images we are going to see for the next four years. Kia ora tato, welcome into the final edition of The Breakdown for season 2023. And we have got quite a lot to discuss. So Steve Hansen is going to join us on the show. Of course, the regular crew are making their way back from France, but we've got an all-star panel to dissect and counsel and get us over. I was actually feeling OK until I watched that. <laughs> but Isaac Boss, Stephen Bates <laughs> and Taylor Johnson with us. Taylor, how has it been the last 48 hours? I don't know, everyone I've spoken to, everyone wants your opinion your thoughts on the game. Absolutely, everywhere you go, you can't not talk about that game. You're at that supermarket, you're at work, everyone's saying, what did you think? And I think, you know, you just can't help but be proud and I know that everyone's disappointed, but at the same time, they did so well to get to where they are. And it sounds weird saying that about an all-black team who's usually so dominant, but you look at all the adversity they've gone through. A lot of people didn't give them a shot past the quarterfinal against Ireland, who, you know, were the number one team in the world. I have to add that in were. Um, but, look, I think I'm really proud of how they came together. To only lose by one point um, when you had 14 men for the majority of the game, I mean, that, that's a good effort. But still disappointed. Uh, four more years, but <laughs> four, more four more years. years. I, it's weird, though. I don't think I've ever heard the word pro Proud you so much, Isaac, when it's come to an All Blacks loss, let alone in a World Cup final. I know, it's quite amazing what a week brings. You're leading into that game, you're expecting... Our expectations are very, very high, and mm. you're expecting them to probably come away with the victory that South Africa couldn't beat us with the way they're going to play. But, yeah, pride's one thing, but even disbelief, and I said it before, my nieces and nephews, some were cheering for Ireland, and they still wish they were there, but... <laughs> Uh, one of them just couldn't believe the final would finish was the All Blacks hadn't won. He said the game should be still going. So, you know, that's our next generation that are, that, that are seeing that and they're uh, and he was in tears. So uh, it was a sad day for a lot of New Zealanders. It's probably a bit disappointing, a little bit hollow, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, they had their chances and they just didn't quite nail it, you know, and that's and that's what happened in the final. So it's extremely disappointing, um, but you mentioned the world proud. They certainly fought, and, and as, a, as a team and as, your, yeah, as any team, all you can really ask for is for your team to fight and put everything on the line. And they missed a couple of moments, but... They certainly fought, didn't they? And they? They tried their very best. And at the end of the day, some days it's just not your day. We've got, obviously, some big issues to dissect. We'll get into TMOs and all of those kind of things, the future Ian Foster's legacy as well. But if we just look at that game as a whole, is it almost as like a reflection of, of where they've been? Good, but not quite good enough on the day. And that's what a lot of people might say. I think they, you know, not quite good enough. South Africa will be disappointed with the way they played. I don't think they played to their strengths uh, totally. But that's what Batesy said before. That's high pressure, high risk uh, environments that, you know, those are the moments that you play a whole season for. And uh, unfortunately, we probably, we didn't nail a couple of those at key times. And I think that's, that's what it came down to. And if they had their moments again, they might change a couple of the options, I think. Yeah. I think South Africa had a bloody hard run into that final. I mean, they had to play Ireland and Paul play, and then they only won their quarter in their semi by one point, you know, so they had a really tough um, lead-up, and they were really battle-hearted, and I think that's where they got on top of us, was just their physical presence. I mean, Peter Steph de Toy, unreal. I mean, 28 tackles, most of them dominant. He was banging everyone, um, and I think he deserved that, and, you know, they all they yeah, all played their physical game. I think the hardened part is the key there. When you look at where you had the hardest side of the draw, but the All Blacks didn't have a tough game since France. And they beat Ireland, and then it's World Cup final. You've also got to remember, too, on the back of that, and you talk about, we're talking about the All Blacks and the disappointment. South Africa were behind the eight ball right from the start. They had a six-day turnaround. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, what's the difference? Six, seven. There's a massive difference between a six- and a seven-day turnaround for your preparation. Mm -hmm. And also, what they did is they almost functioned for, for 75 minutes without someone to throw the ball in. You know what I mean? So they more or less didn't have a line-out. Yeah. They tried to win ball at the front, and they, I, don't, I haven't got their line-out stats, but they were poor, and they found a way. The, I mean, because you, you could look at them, yes, being battled hard, and I think going into that semi-final against England, where they really did scrape their way through at times, they, they looked tired, their forwards set, found these reserves of energies and big games to, fi to find that level of pressure. But you look at the All Black stats, 61% possession, Taylor, uh, 18 bad passes against four, 15 turnovers conceded. You can blame rest and TMOs all you like, and then yeah. you look at some of the numbers. Yeah, and you've got to look internally as well. I mean, we can't always just blame the ref, and I know a lot of people have been, and I don't like the pile on that's happened. <laughs> but there were decisions that we made that weren't, weren't correct. I mean, even, you know, Finlay Christie, two minutes to go, he decided to put in a box kick, you know, and for me, it's hold on to the ball, you know, and it's just those kind of things. I think Aaron Smith had 80 minutes in him as well. Um, but then you also got to look at, you know, the kicks and, you know, Cheslin Colby, I remember, you know, he couldn't even look because he yeah. thought I had cost oh, South Africa the final, Geordie missed, and then the 51-minute mark didn't take the three. I mean, there's so many things you can look back on. So there's no one... 
um, point in that game that lost it for them, but it was just that decision making. It was uncharacteristic. I yeah, think. and I think you know you saw when we beat Ireland in the quarterfinal, Ireland were turning down those kicks at goal, and then it cost mm -hmm. them. You know, mm -hmm. and we were taking them. So little ones like that, I thought was a little bit out of character. Whether that was the pressure and they feel like they had to put a nail in the coffin then uh, psychologically mm -hmm. or on the scoreboard, and, and when they don't quite go your way, I, I think it's a little bit. Um, it, it can have the reverse effect. I'll just say with that 61 percent position that the All Blacks had, they had to play like that. Yeah. And yes, yeah. the weather didn't suit them, mm. but what they didn't want is they didn't want to stop start game. Mm. So they wanted to keep the ball in play. You'd notice that quite often they kicked the ball long, they didn't kick the ball out, Which even though... Island really yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even though the South African line-out was struggling, if they automatically think, oh, let's kick it out, put some pressure on them, they wanted that game to go long and go deep. Mm. And they didn't want the stop-start nature. And mate, we've got there's plenty of excuses. At the end of the day, we didn't win. But also, the conditions didn't help them, because no. the All Blacks knew they needed to break down these guys, you talk about them being tired, go phase after phase after phase after phase, and that was part of their game plan. And as I said, sometimes um, things don't go your way, and the, the weather also didn't help the All Blacks, but South Africa have found a way or functioned without a line-out. <laughs> um, well, the team over in Paris have doing, been doing some massive mahi in the last, what, eight, nine, ten weeks, and we thought, well, we found Jeff and Mills somewhere in transit, we think, in Hong Kong. Some thoughts from them after that final. We're halfway home, Mills. We're in Hong Kong. Yeah. We've had a bit of time now to reflect, not just on what's just happened on the weekend, but obviously Ian Foster's final season in charge with the All Blacks, number of senior players heading away. Um, but let's reflect on the World Cup for a start. Yep. You know, uh, the All Blacks going in, very much the unknown. Um, the last couple of weeks, clearly a big, big result against Ireland, not quite getting across the line. But when you look at it, um, how would you sum up the Rugby World Cup, but also from an All Black perspective? Well, obviously, the result at the end of it, you know, as we're bitterly disappointed, um, would have been a fairy tale finish, wouldn't it? Uh, the fact they came in um, perhaps wasn't the sort of spectacle that we were expecting from the final, but <clears throat> South Africa thoroughly deserved to win that. But to get them there, that was always going to be the big thing. And I suppose looking back at it now, that Irish game was, um, you know, we, as we always knew it was coming, it was a little bit anxious moments during throughout that week, but probably the best game I've sort of seen for a very, very long time, in fact, ever. Um, sort of experience, really. Um, but all in all, they didn't come away with a with a goal. Was it success? Well, I think you look. You know, we constantly talk about the fact, you know, where they sort of come from. You'd probably say it was a success to get to the finals, um, albeit they, they just missed out in South Africa. Look, he's had four years, um, you know, since 2019 to try and prepare. The first two of those, we had a certain pandemic that went around the world, yeah. which certainly challenged the All Blacks. They made. Um, and took some experience and uh, risks um, with some players. Look, I think if they'd look at it, um, the change they had to make last year in terms of the coaching, it took a while for them to find themselves. And then the likes of, uh, I suppose, the failed Roger Tuovasa Sheik, yeah. how much did that affect them finding ultimately their right team and the balance of their squad? So, I mean, I think Ian Foster, what he's managed to do by the end of this Rugby World Cup, I think has made up the ground that they've lost in terms of getting yeah. back to where they are in world rugby. Um, he'll be bitterly like, disappointed, like you say, but I think in terms of the legacy and what he's left, he's had to overcome some real challenges. And you know, he'll look at some selections. I think he'll look at maybe the team he put together initially. He'll ask some questions about whether or not um, he was getting the support he needed yeah. around the group, Mills. Um, but ultimately, he can walk away knowing, I think, that he's, he's put pride back in the jersey. Yeah. And I, I can su certainly support him on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think 100%. I think given where he's sort of come from, I think what you've got to remember also, whilst he's gone through COVID and stuff like that, um, it's probably the only time a coach has really had to really adapt. Adapt because of the challenges they've had. He's lost, you know, and then after that, he's had to adapt again. Lost a couple of coaches, lost a selector. But I totally have to agree. Um, you know, under a lot of scrutiny, there's talk about all the records that have been, the unnecessary records that he's sort of broken. Um, guys coming out and saying the aura has lost this, isn't it? I think he's restored that. I mean, he's got it to a point um, that, that he had it to, you know, um, you know pre taking on this, uh, this role. What we do know is that World Rugby have got some serious question marks and things they need to answer to. In fact, first and foremost, the draw needs to be sorted yeah. for the next Rugby World Cup in terms of trying to get the best teams through to the quarterfinals, the, uh, the semi finals, and they've expanded this tournament. Fascinated <laughs> to see how that plays out. And of course, a lot of discussion about the shape of the game, what it's going to look like and how it should be officiated going forward. Those are things they need to address. Not the stuff that we wanted, wanted to be talked about, were they? You know, um, when we came to this tournament, you know, Super Bowl, I was going to be the most you know, fast-moving, you know, action-packed. 
It hasn't. It's come out and all we're talking about is the refereeing and consistencies in the refereeing, the shape of the game and how that sort of look. There's still contentious issues about, you know, the, the tournaments happening. So it's not it's not looking uh, as healthy as well, I would have wanted it to be. Yeah, and saying that, there were some surprise packages, I think, in the lyrics of Uruguay, uh, Portugal, Portugal, coming into the tournament, showing some good Fiji. signs. But ultimately, Fiji, yeah, but this game has got a lot of things that need to be addressed and talked about. But it's been a big year, Mills. It's been a long eight weeks. <laughs> Team, I cannot wait to get home and see my family, um, but I can't wait as well. As always, guess what? It's a new season, but that's that's a couple of months away. Okay, let's just take a break. Let's take a break. We're not, we're not on Macri Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, it looks like a long old trip home for Mills. Um, he's only, <laughs> he was only halfway there. Um, as rough as it you know, can say it when he's in the air. Um, one of the points they do bring up, though, is Ian Foster and where his legacy is. And we asked Sir Steve Hansen as well how he sees Ian Foster's tenure as All Blacks coach. I think he should be remembered as the coach that had to go through COVID, had to go through a period in our game where... Uh, he probably didn't get the support um, as much as he should have. I think he got the greatest affirmation you can get as a coach is when your players love you. And they certainly know what's going on 24-7, your players. And if they uh, don't think you're good enough, they'll tell you or they'll tell people you need to go. The main thing is we got behind Ian during that World Cup. And I think the public... Uh, swung in behind him, which was wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, by the grace of God, he could have, you know, the team could have easily won it. You know, Jordy Barrett will will forever be asking himself, you know, why did I miss that? Um, Richie Moana at the same with the conversion. But, you know, that's sport. Mm. That's why World Cups, big events are hard to win because sometimes we just don't get what we want. We have to accept that. Uh, and I think that's where Fozzie's earned you know, his money. He's accepted what's been passed down to him, but he's still gone out and done a job that he can be proud of, we can be proud of, and most of all, his players are proud of and, and love him for it. So this is Ian Foster's coaching record, the numbers that he will be judged by rightly or wrongly in his tenure as All Blacks coach, or is it coach 41, so a 70% winning record, which when, on the face of it, I think a lot of rugby coaches, Eddie Jones would be happy for a 70% winning record <laughs> right about now, but um, um, Isaac, Batesy, you both know him, you've been coached by him. Um, what it, where do you see his tenure and his legacy? Well, whenever I see Fozzie, all I think is is, is boss's old man. It's the it's the Tukaroa TA connection. So I'll leave it to his son over there. <laughs> God, just because he never picked you, baby. That's why you're sitting here. You're never going into those tournaments. But no, I think he actually probably resurrected himself as a coach, mm. uh, especially in this last year. And uh, I really like what. Um, Steve Hansen said there where he said like the greatest affirmation you can get is when your players stick by you. Mm. And they did it last year. The whole country wanted his head, basically. He was out the door. He was he out was the door. Gone. And basically he's done the unthinkable of getting them into him. They've created moments to win the World Cup and they just haven't quite nailed the moments. And this is not even 12 months on from, from where they were. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, seeing signs of him as a coach. And where to from here, I think, you know, the world's his oyster to yep. an extent. I just think around that, and I, I don't have the stats on me, 70%. I don't know where he stands in, in the all-black coaching scheme of things. He's off the back of, like, Graham Henry, Sir Graham Henry, Sir Steve Hansen, so a pretty hard act to follow. But I do believe that that sort of percentage is going to be the new norm for all-black coaches. I don't think we're going to have all-black coaches that are in the 90s anymore. I think the game has changed around the world, and I think our time of dominating week in, week out, year in, year out, has gone. And, and then it comes to me, the question is, is if we won, if we scored two more points on the weekend, yeah. two more points, right, 
do with then, we forget all the rest of the four years, and then it's just like South Africa, it's World Cup to World Cup. What happens in between that, does that really matter if we're the world champions? But do we need to forget the last four years? Because he never lost the Rugby Championship, we never lost the Billions, so we still retain the Freedom Cup, we kept all of those, and we did better than the last World Cup. So, you know, like, we actually have to look at it at that perspective as well, and, and to your point, everyone else is caught up. That winning percentage, I think, is going to be the norm. Um, you know, you look at the investment that people like Ireland made. You know, five years ago, if you'd said Ireland is going to be the number one team in the world. I would have laughed because, you know, the All Blacks and that, we just had such dominance. Um, and then you also look at Australia. They're also, you know, everyone else has invested in Australia hasn't. They're, you know, NRL, all that kind of stuff is there. So that's also worked against them too. So others have got better. Australia, you know, they've had more competition. And the All Blacks, yes, we're still up there. You know, we're not outright the best like we used to, but it's totally representative of the rugby landscape at the moment. So I think Fozzie has done an outstanding job and shouldn't be remembered as one of, you know, people say, oh, he's what the worst coach I've had. No, he's not. You look at that and he's done well. He was on the back foot in the court of public opinion right yes. from the very start as soon as he took over that job. Do we perhaps almost need a better understanding of the quality of rugby in the Northern Hemisphere? Yes, there's all the North-South thing, but of, of Ireland and France and what they actually do in their grassroots and the way they bring things through that, you know, we, we can't just turn up and win anymore. No, and I 100% I, I agree with you. And our probably our rugby IQ is probably diminishing a little bit. Uh, and uh, as I say that as a, as a purist, and I've been in all the different environments, and they're very well coached. And from a young age, they know their rugby there in Europe now, whether it's Ireland, England, France. But it's also the fact that our grassroots competitions, uh, the NPC, thoroughly brilliant. I think the next step up, the Super Rugby, is challenging. And it's challenging uh, the makeup. You can see it having an effect on Australia, and it's going to have a similar effect on us at the moment, I think. And I think the biggest competitions in that in that real professional era, uh, the, the better ones are in the Northern Hemisphere, I think. And I think that's teaching them how to win uh, final moments like that. Before we move on, where do you think Ian Foster goes now? I don't know, and he said recently that he wants to keep coaching, but what I do know is it's been a tough four years. It has, you know. You said uh, that... that some areas of the public have been against him, but what he's done through that is jeepers he's built up some resilience and jeepers he's built up some, some real understanding of how to deal with different things and get through those times as well. So I'm not sure where he goes. Um, Australia's looking for a coach. I, know, that's I don't think so. I don't think so. He won't uh, do it. He won't do it. Fiji's looking yeah. for a coach. So, but I'll tell you what, he's got a wealth of experience on good times and bad times. Yeah. So yeah. what a man to have involved yeah. in your system. Maybe not as head coach, maybe that's not what he wants to do. Well, while we're doing some crystal ball gazing then, uh, let's have a look at this. Now, this is the breakdown production crew's potential first test team for a test. I know, I know we have only just finished this year, but we're going to 2024 already. <laughs> so a front row of three guys who played and started a, a World Cup final. And then you look at the locking department. Obviously, this is going to be an area to Povey. Guys like Josh Lord come into the mix. Scott Barrett, um, obviously, a, a contender. Sam Kane still with a C by his name. Name can, according to our production crew, Artie Savia, Ethan Blackadder. Over to the backs, then you've got, well, in a potentially very exciting combination of Roygaard and McKenzie. Through the middle, Geordie Barrett's still going to be there. Rico Ioani, the long term partnership in the middle by the look of that. And then out the back, boy, that is some excitement. Will Jordan, Emone Narawa, and Mark Talia. And these are just guys that the crew have come up with. We're missing a few there, but Basically, we get like all wound up. Oh, so many players are leaving, and yes, this time around there are some absolute legends leaving. Mm. But it's not all doom and gloom. That's not a bad side. No, certainly not. And there's plenty of people, as you mentioned, that uh, at the back of there. You look at guys like Anton Leonard Brown. He hasn't got a spot. Mm. Uh, Finlay Christie hasn't got a spot. Mm. You've got a couple of guys that missed out on the World Cup this year that have had bad runs with injuries. Mm. Patrick Tupolotu, Akiri Iwani. You know what I mean? So there is people around. Callum Grace from down Crusader Country. So there, there's people around. And and what it does become is it does make Super Rugby a whole lot new, more interesting because you've got a new coach, a new mm. setup, and within reason, everything goes out the window. So it's a genuine competition right now. Can we not make it a four-month a, a four All Blacks trial, though, Super Rugby, this year? We actually sit and enjoy and see what these guys do. Please. Can they all please play? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just on that, I mean... The top 14 players, they play something like 40 games. Half of them are back. Exactly. You know, and then we're going to even like, this is a conversation for another day. <laughs> but, I mean, when you look at that team, it's exciting. And I remember watching the post-match pictures. Yes, Geordie Barrett was crying. But, you know, I saw the look on Dalton Papali'i's face. And it, it was devastation, but it was also... He was annoyed, and you could tell... 
I never want to feel this kind of loss again. So mm. you look at someone like that young who felt, you know, they were almost there. He was devastated. And he's someone I think, you know, be careful in the next few years. Yeah. He could be there too. And there's a number of those players that have a taste and with, uh, through the MPC, even we've seen some really good bolting players. And you've got the likes of Savia who, who might not be eligible in the first test. So, you you know, that will be the Dalton Papalitis or um, Luke, Luke Jacobson. Mm. You've got Lord in that lock. You've got, don't discount someone like TJ Perinata. Mm. You know, his experience could be really crucial in building through some of these young players to come through uh, for the next four years' time. Quintapire at 12. So all of a sudden, we look at that depth. There's a lot of depth. You know, we're missing a few key players that were big. They were here for the World Cup and win the World Cup, and they'll be disappointed they didn't get it, but they've left New Zealand rugby, I think, in a really good spot, and uh, it's an exciting time ahead.